Now we're going to talk about what we can do with some of these circuit elements. We're going to talk about how you build and analyze direct current circuits. Um, we will start with basic circuits and calculating equivalent circuits. So a couple of examples. Um, here you can see uh, um, a battery which is in series with, uh, with three different resistors. Now, when we have resistors in series, resistors in series add. So the three different resistors in series add up to be one equivalent resistor. And the way that we add them is that the effective resistor, um, the effective resistance is equal to resistance one plus resistance two plus resistance three. Um, and then you can redraw the original circuit as if it has a single resistor around it. And then when you want to calculate the, um, if you want to calculate the current through that circuit, then it is, the current is equal to the, um, I'm sorry, the voltage is equal to the current times the effective resistance. You are given the, um, the voltage, so you can calculate that the current is equal to the voltage divided, uh, applied to the circuit, divided by the effective voltage. You can, now, the current is the same throughout the circuit because every, any little bit of current has to go through all three elements, so that's in series. Again, go back to the analogy of current being like water flowing through pipes. So if current is like water flowing through the pipes, as the water ha all the water has to go through all of the pipes. Now, if you want to calculate the, um, the voltage drop across each individual element, so now I want to calculate voltage one, voltage two, and voltage three. Um, the current is the same, so voltage one is equal to the current through the circuit times resistance one, which is equal to the total voltage times, I'm plugging this into there, um, times R1 over the over R effective. And I get similar equations for elements two and three. And then I can check that the voltage drop across each of these elements is equal to the total voltage. So the voltage drop from here, from all the way around the circuit, is going to equal to be equal to V1 plus V2 plus V3. And that is equal to the total voltage divided by the effective resistance times R1 plus R2 plus R3. Now, the effective resistance is R1 plus R2 plus R3. So, I get that the total voltage across the circuit is V, as expected. So we're going to do a series. We're going to do throughout the this chapter a bunch of problems where we apply this and we calculate. Uh, we're largely interested in calculating the current through the circuit. Um, there's a there's a variety of different ways that you can ask the question, just like we've seen in other chapters, um, and we should be able to calculate anything and everything about the, um, about the circuit. Often the problem stops by asking, well, what is the equivalent resistance? Um, and you just stop there. Um, so we're going to analyze a few different complicated circuits. Um, all right. Now, here you can see a slightly more, uh, you know, just more elements. There's no limit to how many resistances you can add up. So here you have five resistances in series, and the effective resistance is the sum of all of them. R1 plus R2 plus R3 plus R4 plus R5. That is 20 ohms plus 20 ohms plus 20 ohms plus 20 ohms plus 10 ohms, or 
90 ohms. The effective resistance for this circuit is 90 ohms. And then I can redraw this. Remember, I am lazy, so I usually do not draw the more elaborate voltage source. This is equivalent to a circuit with a 9 volt battery and a 90 ohm resistor. So these two circuits are going to have the same current through them. So if you had that battery uh, hooked up, it's going to last as long whether it's hooked up to this circuit or that circuit. All right. Now, this one is a little bit more complicated. So here, when, so this one we have objects in parallel. If you remember back to when we were working with capacitances, um, we talked about adding capacitances. A, a funny thing, capacitances add in the opposite way of resistances. So for resistances in parallel, um, if you have two resistors in parallel, the effective resistance is R1 plus R2. If you have capacitors in parallel, 1 over the effective capacitance is 1 over capacitance 1 plus 1 over capacitance 2. Resistors in series, or, or sorry, ah, I switched these up. This is in series, and that's what I meant here. This is in series. Um, resistors in parallel, sorry, this is parallel, meaning that the two circuit elements are parallel to each other. Now, you have to look a little carefully at the circuit because you might have the resistors slightly, it might not immediately look parallel, but it means that the same current comes in, one side goes through either path and it comes out and, and, and then it merges back together when it comes out. All right, so resistors in parallel, one over the effective resistance is equal to one over resistance one plus one over resistance two. Um, capacitors in parallel, uh, they add like capacitance one plus capacitance two. So resistors in series add like capacitors in parallel. Resistors in parallel add like capacitors in series. All right, that said, now we can start looking at this circuit. So this circuit has two resistors in parallel. So we're going to use our rule for resistors in parallel. The inverses add instead of the resistances. And if we want to have the effective res resistance for this circuit, R the effective resistance is equal to the inverse of 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. Okay, so an equivalent circuit uh, has this resistance. Now, one thing to notice is that the in general, when you have two resistors in parallel, the resistance goes down. Um, so as an example, Let's consider R1 equal to R2, and we'll just call that R. In that case, the effective resistance is 1 over R plus 1 over R, and it is the inverse of that. So it is the inverse of 2 over R, or it is R over 2. So the resistance decreases when you have resistors in parallel. Why does that happen? Go back to our analogy of current being like water flowing through pipes. If this is like water flowing through pipes, then um, if you have two different pipes in parallel, now you have more area where water can flow through. It's going to flow faster. Here, you've added a pipe so you can get more what you can get more water through because there's more area for the water to go through. So adding resistors in parallel makes the resistance go down.
Okay, this circuit is slightly more complicated. So now we have um, a resistor in series with two resistors in parallel. So we're going to do a few different, we're going to simplify this circuit in a couple different stages. Um, you always have to pick which one you're going to do first. So um, pick a circuit element that you can simplify and you're going to start there um, and then draw an equivalent circuit, move to the next circuit and uh, well, we'll redraw it completely. So the first thing that we're going to do is add these two resistors. So I'm going to redraw my circuit and now I still have R1. It is still here, but I am going to replace R2 and R3 by their equivalent resistance. And this is my new circuit. And their equivalent resistance is 1 over R2, is the inverse of 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3. Um, and now I want to add these together. So now I'm going to, now I have two resistors in series, so I am going to replace them by a single resistor, and my effective resistance is R1 plus the inverse of 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3. And so even with very complicated circuits, what you can do is that you can successively um, simplify the, um, the circuit. And I personally find it really helpful to redraw the circuit every time that I do this. It makes me, it makes the problem take a lot of space, especially if I have more complicated problems. But um, it makes me less likely to make a mistake. And remember that one of the things that you're trying to do here is develop your problem solving skills. You're trying to develop habits that make it hard to make mistakes. The most common mistakes are what we call dumb mistakes, where you make a simple, <laughs> you're trying, usually you're trying to do too many steps at once. And that's where you're going to make a mistake because you have a logic error. You, you misinterpreted something. And I also find with, um, so back when I was a student, we didn't have problem, have computer-based problems that you could solve. What I found is that often students who have been educated when there's computer-based problems to solve, computer-based problem solving is answer focused and you tend to be rewarded for solving the problem quickly rather than meticulous and careful problem solving. So I think your generation is more likely to try to rush through the problem to get it done faster and therefore somewhat more likely to make careless mistakes. So get in the habit, write out the, redraw the circuit every time that you replace a, simple, an, a circuit element by some simplification, physically draw it and draw each step, write everything down meticulously, it's gonna make you less prone to making careless mistakes. All right, so then here, once we have those tools, we can, um, we can start answering real world questions. Why do lights dim when a large appliance is switched on? Um, because the current um, draw, there's a large current draw that leads to a voltage drop in the wires. Okay, so now here we have our refrigerator modeled like this. When you hook it up to the circuit, you have some resistance in the wire. Um, and uh, then you have it hooked up, for instance, to the motor and the, um, and the appliance itself. Now, if the refrigerator is not plugged in, you do not get any um, current through the wire at all. As soon as we plug it in, we get a large current because the refrigerator takes a lot of current to run. 
So there's a large current, and when there's a large current, even though this resistance is fairly small, especially compared to the refrigerator, you're going to get a slight voltage drop across the, the wire, so your effective voltage is smaller. And a light bulb that you have hooked up in the, to the same circuit is going to see less current than it would if the refrigerator were not plugged in. All right. Here's another one of those um, one of those problems. So here we're given the current is two amps. Now, if the current is two amps, that tells us it's two amps everywhere. This question says find the unknown voltage, um, and first we have to find the equivalent resistance of the circuit. So we are going to draw. Um, we're going to redraw this circuit, and we're going to replace the circuit elements. Um, by our more simple circuit elements. So I'm actually going to do two steps at once to show you how you can do it without being, you know, you can simplify um, more than one thing, just be a little careful. So the first thing that I'm going to do is replace resistance 1 and resistance 2 by one equivalent resistance. And this resistance is equal to resistance one plus resistance two because these two resistances are in series. So because they're in series, um, I can add them and I get a resistance of 20 ohms. It's not showing up quite so clearly. Up. All right, so my resistance is 20 ohms. And now I'm going to replace these resistances, th these resistances by one effective resistance, this marker stinks. All right, so now this resistance, the effective resistance is one over R, the inverse of one over R three plus one over R four. So this is equal to one over 10 ohms plus one over 10 ohms is two over 10 ohms. And the inverse is 10 ohms over two or five ohms. So now in this circuit, so what I did is that I did replace two elements at once, but I kept it kind of simple. And if you want to make it clear what you're doing, all of your work is going to be graded by someone. And the clearer that you can make it, the more likely you are to get credit. All right, so I have replaced these circuit elements by this circuit element. And I'm going to come over here. I am replacing these circuit elements by this circuit element. All right, now I'm going to do another round of simplification. By, if, you want a, if you want a way to make your work clear, color code, circle, use careful indices, um, in which case, if I'm trying to use careful indices, I don't want to reuse. Um, I don't want to reuse R1. I will call it R5 and R6. All right. Now I'm going to redraw this circuit, and I'm going to combine these two resistances because now I have simply two resistors in parallel. That is easy. So I can replace those two resistances by one resistance. If I want to draw carefully and meticulously what I am doing, I am taking these guys and replacing them by that. All right, so now I have this effective resistance is R5 plus R6. I will call it R7 is equal to R5 plus R6. And that is equal to 20 plus ohms plus 5 ohms or 25 ohms. 
Now, if I want to go back and find this voltage, I'm told that, the, um, that there are two amps traveling through the circuit. So voltage is equal to current times resistance. Um, and so I have two amps times 25 ohms is 50 volts. Okay, so I would encourage you to follow a clear strategy like that where you articulate which circuit units, you, which circuit components you're combi combining first and slowly work through them all until you have, um, if you only have resistors, what you're working towards is having only a single resistor in your circuit. And then that is a problem that you can solve. Um, if it is a single resistor in a circuit, the only thing that you, then you can just apply Ohm's law. Um, and we will get to some circuits where you cannot apply Ohm's law, um, but this is a good place to start. All right. Now we're going to go through Kirchhoff's rules. So we can use Ohm's law if we have circuit elements that we actually know how to combine. We have to use Kirchhoff's rules if we can't clearly combine circuit elements. This is a circuit that we cannot figure out. We don't have the, the tools to, uh, we don't have the tools to identify what, um, to, to combine all the circuit elements. There are things that we can combine so we can combine these two elements and those two elements. I'm going to just redraw that circuit so that we know what, we're, what that would look like. So that would be a resistor here. And that's going to be R1 plus R2. We have, actually, I'm going to draw it a little bit differently so it's really clear which elements are parallel and which are in series. So we would have a resistor R1 plus R2 and a voltage V1. And then here we would have a resistance R3 and a voltage V2 and a resistor R5 plus R4 because these two elements are in series. So that's simpler. But the problem is that now we have a voltage source that is in series with a resistor in parallel with a different resistor and in series with a resistor and voltage pair. So we don't have, um, we don't have rules for how we add this voltage to that. So we are going to introduce Kirchhoff's rules, which sound like they're fancy and special, but they really just amount to energy and current, uh, energy conservation and conservation of charge. All right, so one of Kirchhoff's rules is that if you look at a junction, the sum of the currents in has to equal the sum of the currents out. Now, when you are solving, uh, when you're analyzing these circuits, you don't necessarily know the direction of the current, so you're going to have to pick something. And it doesn't matter which way you, which one you pick, whether you say that the current is in this direction or in that direction. If you picked the wrong sign, all that's going to happen is that the current is going to, that one of these will end up having a negative sign. If the current has a negative sign, that just means that you picked the wrong direction, and that's okay. Uh, okay, so what this says is the, uh, the sum of the currents into the junction 
has to equal the sum of the currents out of the junction. Again, it is helpful to go back to our analogy that this is like pipe water flowing through pipes, that if you, if you are in an equilibrium state, the amount of water flowing in has to equal, to the, equal the amount of water flowing out. The second one of Kirchhoff's rules says that um, the algebraic sum of the voltage differences across a loop is equal to zero. So remember, when we talk voltages, this really corresponds to some type of potential energy difference. Um, so what that says is that if you walk around in a loop, and so you, you have to end up at the same place you started with, um, we can go back to our analogy where the potential energy is like, is like height. So if you, st if you go on a hike and you walk around in a circle and you end up back where you started, then the sum of the amount of the stuff that you, how much you went down plus how much you went up, the changes, those are analogous to your voltage drops, that has to equal zero. So um, somehow when you go in a loop, you have to end up back where you started. That's all that, the, that Kirchhoff's second rule says. All right. So um, let's see. Then we're going to draw these loops, and we have to uh, we have to consider things carefully. So when we move across a resistor in the same direction as the current flow, you subtract the potential drop. So if you're going if you're going with the flow, then the potential is dropping. If you are going in the opposite direction, then the potential is going up. Um, and then when you go across a voltage source from the negative to the positive terminal, then you add the potential. Um, and that's, think of this as a battery is like a step. Every time you go across a battery or, or an elevator, every time you go across a battery, you're kicked up from the ground to the top. Um, and then when you're going, and when you go from positive to negative, then the potential decreases. So you have to subtract the, the potential drop. All right, so um, this circuit, so at first glance, this cir circuit contains two junctions. So you got this guy and that guy, but only one should be considered because their junctions are equivalent. Um, now, if you write too many equations, as long as you are careful about it, it's going to be okay because you will simply end up with redundant equations. So this is a case where I would say, do not try to be too clever because if you try to be too clever, you're likely to make a stupid mistake. Okay, so then um, here the, um, there, there, have, there are a number of conventions um, that have been written here, choices. At some point, you make a choice. So the current has chosen to, we, uh, we made a guess that the current is going in this direction here, and that it's going in that direction there. It doesn't have to. The currents are denoted by which um, resistor they go through. So this has a current I3 going through it, and this has a current I2, and this has a current I1. All right, and now, if you are in my class, the way that you're, <laughs> then I only give you one of these problems because these are really, you, you rapidly end up with multiple sets of coupled equations, and solving them takes a really long time. Now, if you continue on in physics, at some point you're going to take a math class that, will, that teaches you how to work with matrices, and then it becomes really easy to solve, but it, at this level you usually haven't been introduced to matrices. All right, so let's take Kirchhoff's law, Kirchhoff's rules, and let's look at how we can write that. So the first one says that the current um, the sum of the currents going into a junction 
has to equal the sum of the currents going out of the junction. So if we look at j this junction at corner B, we end up with the following equation. We say I1 has to equal I3 plus I2. Now, why was that stated that this, these two junctions are equivalent? Well, we can look at the current into this junction. That is I2 plus I3. So that's the current going in. That is equal to I1. These two equations, they are, they are redundant. One of the, they are equivalent. They are the exact same equation. That's why it didn't give us any additional information. Now we're going to look at the voltage drops. So we are going to go around in a circle. And um, first of all, so our rule was that the, uh, the voltage drops have to sum to zero. All right, so if we go from F to A, we are increasing our voltage by the voltage V. And then we go from A to B, we are decreasing the voltage because there's a voltage drop across a resistor. And our rule said that uh, uh, here, if we go across a resistor in the same direction as the current, we subtract it. We know the potential is decreasing as we go across this loop. All right, so the voltage drop here, I'm going to just go ahead and use V equals IR. I'm going to use Ohm's law as we go through this. So the voltage drop, drop across the resistor, 1 is I1 R1. And then I'm going to go from B to E. And the voltage drop across that is I2 R2. And then I get to E. And to get back here, I, um, I don't have to do any, I don't go through any more resistors. So I have gone completely around in the circle, and this has to, and I have to get to zero. All right, and then I'm going to choose a different, I'm going to go through this loop. So I've done this loop, and I've done this loop. So, uh, well, I'm going to do this loop. So let's see, the sum of voltage drops across the loop. So here I get I3R3. That is one loop. And then here, so I'm going, let's see, I'm going with the current there. And then here, I'm going opposite to the current. So I have to add I to R2. And then I get back to where I started to be. So this is equal to 0. So here, I have. Three, so presumably, um, if I, I would know the resistance, if I, I could know the, the question could ask me, what are the three currents? And you're given the resistors. Um, so if the resistors are fixed, there's three unknowns, each of the three currents. And now I have three equations and three unknowns. So I can solve this problem exactly. Now, this is a coupled set of linear equations. So solving three equations for three unknowns without matrix algebra, which you guys haven't learned yet, is a pain. It, it's, it's a pain. So I'm all, when I teach, I only have my students do one problem because this part gets ugly. Setting the problem up is not so difficult. Um, that's physics. And then from here, it's math. Um, now, you may wonder, why did I choose to do this loop? And that loop, it's arbitrary. I could choose this loop and this loop, or this loop and this loop, or let's see, this loop and this loop. It doesn't matter. Um, and you can do as many loops as you want. If you do them correctly, 
you will get redundant equations and you will end up if there's three um, if there's three different circuit elements so three resistors um, with th their three separate currents you will end up with three equations so some of them will turn out to be redundant uh, so that's one of the beautiful things about this but also one of the tricky things because there isn't a right way to do the problem there are a hundred ways to do the problem. You have to do things in a self-consistent way. There are a bunch of ways that you can be clever and maybe simplify problems, um, but it can be really tricky to be clever. So try not to overthink it. Sometimes, sometimes the hard part is setting up the physics, and then from there, um, the math is just turning the crank. Um, so don't try to be too clever. Now, sometimes you can see something where, okay, well, a particular form of the equation makes it easier to solve faster. That said, no matter what, you're going to get the same three equations that, like, they're all redundant. So don't fret too much about picking the right answer. Fret a little bit more about making sure that you set it up correctly because if you have to solve a coupled set of three linear equations with three un and three unknowns without using matrix algebra and you make a simple, uh, you make a careless mistake, it's really hard to go back and check. All right, so let's see. Yeah, so oh, the other thing, well, while there's some arbitrary choices about what loops you choose, you need to have loops all of your sets of loops need to contain all of the elements. So here you can choose these two loops, these two, any of these. And, you know, here you've got some redundancy because you've done three loops and there's really only two independent loops. But that's okay. Redundant information is still information and you can at least check your work. So I tend to be of the philosophy Go for it. Don't worry too much. Make sure you have, do make sure you have all of your circuit elements in there. All right. So here you have a, um, a multi-loop circuit here. So you can choose, again, like the previous one, you can do this loop and this loop. And then here you have two different junctions. Same construction here. Um, it does help if you, um, so... I like to draw on the circuit what I have chosen for orientation, and it is helpful, if nothing else, for you to keep track of it, to have, um, have different locations labeled on it. Um, and then I like to do a little bit more. So I like to say that R1, let's see, I1 is going in that direction, and let's choose I3, or let's see, that's R, that's R2, so this should be R I2. And then here we'll make I3 go like that, and I4 go like that. So I like to label it so that when I'm doing this, I do not um, lose track of it. All right, so here, this circuit is a combination of parallel and series configurations of resistors. So you can't use this using our previous chapters, but you can use Kirchhoff's rules. So here you've got two loops. You could choose to do, well, you could choose any set of, any of the, there's three different loops you can draw. You have to choose at least two of them. Um, and then you would have to consider the drops as you go around in a circle um, around the loops as well as the total current. All right, now we can move on to RC circuits, or so this st stands for a resistor and then a capacitor. So if you have an RC circuit, um, you have a voltage source and then a resistor, and then a capacitor. Now, when you have direct current, um, 
this capacitor acts like an open circuit. So um, the equilibrium state is that no current flows. We're going to talk about what happens when you have alternating current because then you get some really cool phenomena. That's an RC circuit. It just has a resistor and a capacitor. All right, so um, <clears throat> here, this is showing um, you have a switch so that you can change. Um, you can either charge up the capacitor or let it discharge um, either way. So when you have the, um, so when you, um, you start where there's no charge across the capacitor. You're going to flip the circuit so that you charge up the capacitor. And then you flip the switch. And now um, you have nothing connected to the battery. So now you are discharging the capacitor. So here, depending on which way you have the switch flipped, you are either charging up the capacitor or discharging the capacitor. And we are going to, we're going to look at what that happens, what that does as a function of um, of time. Okay, so we're going to look at what happens as we um, as we charge up the capacitor. So that's when we flip the switch and ah, got to put a resistor in there, and then we have our capacitor. So when we charge up our capacitor. Um, so the voltage across the whole circuit has to equal whatever voltage we apply. Um, so when we charge up our capacitor, um, we start having zero voltage across the capacitor, and it slowly, um, it slowly reaches the point where we reach, as the current travels through the resistor, you, you slowly approach the point where the voltage is entirely across the capacitor. That is that when this voltage equals the, that voltage, current no longer flows because it's an open circuit because that's what a capacitor is. Now, the voltage across the, um, the resistor at the same time, um, at first, when you, when you close the switch, there's, um, uh, sorry, this is the, yeah, the voltage, let's see. So the voltage across the capacitor, this is the charge as a fun on the capacitor as a function of time. This is the voltage across the capacitor as a function of time because the voltage is proportional to the charge uh, across the capacitor. So we slowly reach the point where we have all of the, ch the potential across the capacitor. If we look at what's going on at the resistor at the same time, it's the, as the capacitor charges up, the amount of uh, the voltage across the resistor decreases. So uh, you end up with the, um, you end up with all of the charge initially, the potential across the resistor, because this is at the same, the, the poten potential across the resistor is initially the whole resistance. And then as charge builds up here, you reach having, uh, you reach a potential is of zero. So, the, the charge across the, the voltage across the resistor exponentially decays. The voltage across the capacitor approaches the, um, the, plat the, the plateau. And as you are discharging, so this is for the capacitor charging. This is for the capacitor discharging. So replace this by a wire, and it does the opposite. So here, capacitor charging as a function of time, and then when it discharges, you end up with current flowing across so that all the potential is, um, is across the resistor. All right, and then we can even write what these equations are. So you always have the potential is equal to the total potential either times e to the negative t over tau, where tau is the time constant of Rc. That is when something is discharging, it has this form. When something is charging, it takes this form. 
So, and this you can solve with differential equations, but this is, I, you guys mostly have not had differential equations, so I'm not gonna do it. Um, so if something is charging, you, and you need the solution that ends up, so when t goes to infinity, this is e to the negative zero, so this is, or this is e to the, um, to the zero, so this is one. Uh, let's see, this is, sorry, when t goes to infinity, this gets, a very, gets very large, so this goes to zero, so you end up approaching the, uh, approaching v naught. When t goes to infinity, this goes to zero. Um, so you just wanna think about which is the right answer for your particular problem. Now the book gives you some rules, and if you try to meticulously write these down, you can make a lot of careless mistakes grabbing the wrong rule, um, but if you think about what it actually means, um, you're going to uh, you're going to end up with the um, end up with the right equation. So, physics is not something that you can just memorize, and that that's where a lot of people get tripped up. Always think about what's going on physically. Your answers are always going to have the one form or the other and you have to look at which one is the right form for the problem that you actually have. All right. Now, um, here we have two capacitors and two resistors. So here you're modeling the battery as having a slight resistance. This is a pretty good model of a real battery because, um, because no battery is perfect. Um, so a perfect battery just supplies whatever voltage and doesn't have any, is not impacted by the current whatsoever. But a real battery you can treat as having the voltage plus some effective current, which is relatively small. Um, you've got your RC, you've got your load, and then you've got some capacitance. So you can, um, you can charge up the, um, you can charge up the capacitance there. All right. Now here we can consider this example. What you do here is that you open and close the, this is, this is used as an example for how um, windshield wipers work, where you open and close the circuit so that you end up charging and discharging the, um, the capacitor, which leads to the, um, the, the resistance is the, the, oh, the wiper, and it leads to the wiper going back and forth. All right, so, um, now we're going to do some exercises. The question here is, uh, why should you not correct, connect an ammeter directly across a voltage source as shown below? You should not connect an ammeter like that because this resistance is incredibly large. This is going to lead to a very high current. And then the current across the ammeter is so large that it can actually burn the ammeter um, and make it fry. All right, exercise three. This one asks us to find the, the currents. Um, so here, what we can do, I don't see any circuit elements we can um, simplify. So we're gonna have to, um, we're gonna have to use Kirchhoff's laws, which, are, which is the point. Um, and then there are, this is already labeled the directions for the currents. Um, when in doubt, why not do what the book points you to do? It's probably a good idea. Um, and we will consider two loops. And I will consider oh, that one. So we'll consider this loop. And this loop. And then we should find three equations in three unknowns. We're gonna look at these two junctions and these two loops. We're gonna end up with some redundant equations. That's okay. Um, we will, I'd rather write the redundant equations. I'd rather start with too many equations than not enough. Now, here, let's see, we can draw what's going on here. This has to equal current I1 because whatever is going here has to come that, that this current all has to go through there. This is um, 
This is going to be current R3, so or, or I3, so I3 is going in here, and I2 is going up there. So I'm going to guess that those are our two redundant um, junctions, but I will go through them anyways. All right, here we consider that junction, and we get I1 plus I2, that's the, the current going in, equals I3, that's the current going out. Down here, we end up with I1 plus I2 equals I3, that is indeed equivalent to that equation. Now, I'm going to go across this loop, so voltage 1, because I'm going from negative to positive, so a positive charge sees a jump, minus I1R1, I get, so, get a voltage drop there, and then I am going the opposite of the direction for, that's drawn for I2, so I have plus I2R2 equals zero. In that loop, I have to end up getting all the way back around to where I started. All right, I'm going to do the other loop now. And here I'm going to start. Uh, I'm going to start here. So I'm going through circuit element three. So I get minus I3 R3 and then plus I2 R, oh wait, I'm going in the direction of I, the current for I2, so I'm going to actually have a minus sign, because I'm going with the flow, I'm going through a current drop, and then I go from negative to positive, so I have to add a V2, um, and that all has to equal zero, because I have to end up at the same place I started. Now, I'm going to go ahead and do, even though I know that it's going to be redundant, I am going to go ahead and do the loop across here, because I want to show you that it's redundant. So, when I do that, I get V, so I'm going to start here, and I get V1 minus R1, let me put the eyes first always, just to have some convention, minus I1, R1, and then here I have to add V2 and subtract I3, R3. I am going to, let me call this equation A, B, C, and I am going to look at C minus A. So if I take equation C and I subtract off equation A, these two elements cancel. And I am left with V2 minus I3R3 minus I2R2 equals zero. Got the zero there. Um, so now you can see that this is equivalent to equation B. So when I did three loops, I got redundant equations. So all I need is three. Now, I am not going to work through, I'm doing the thing that I usually do. I like, I put the variables in and I'm not going to, I only plug numbers in at the very end. This asks to find the voltages and currents um, across the different elements. Once you've found the currents, then you, because you're given the, the um, resistances, then you know the voltage drops across each of the different elements. I am not going to do the I'm not going to give the full answer because solving this generically for three unknowns is a real pain in the butt. 
Um, and let's see. I don't see a lot of, there, there's a lot of algebra there. So at this, the point that you reach this, it's just plugging in numbers. You would have to solve to isolate one and then solve for one and then proceed with eliminating, using that to the eliminate the others. Or if you know how to do linear algebra um, and you can even use matrices, that would be infinitely easier. At this point in my life, I would just use matrices too. All right, and that's actually another reason it's a hard topic to have problems on is because there's multiple different ways that you could set this up. So I can't just say, well, set it up, but don't solve it because you can do an, any different number of loops and junctions. All right. And with that, we're going to go ahead and end this chapter um, and see you for the next one.